impressive thing about these meetings that we've been having around the country is hearing what the audience have to say um, about this debate and what it means to them and what is actually going on in their lives. So thank you all for coming um, and thanks to also the organisers for holding your nerve and standing your ground and getting us this wonderful space and making this meeting possible. Um, so I'm a co-founder of Women's Place UK and I plan just to speak about the five reasons why our campaign exists, these very reasonable demands. I think you would agree they're very reasonable, despite the fact that we are being called a transphobic hate group, as uh, Dawn said, complicit in all these terrible things, um, even the death of people, for because women want to talk about legislation that affects us as women and affects our lives. So our first, um, our first reason for existing is that we want respectful and evidence-based discussion on the impact of law change and we assert that women's voices must be heard. You would think that would be uncontroversial. Clearly the legal definition of sex is important for everyone. We are all covered by the protected characteristic of sex, whether you're a man or a woman, you're, you're covered by that um, protected characteristic in the Equality Act, and it's quite wrong to present changes to the legal definition of sex, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about um, changing the mechanisms or thresholds for uh, acquisition of legally recognised gender. Um, it's quite wrong to talk about it as if it only affects transgender people. Um, and women particularly have more recourse to the equality law under this protected characteristic because sexism affects us as women. And yet no women's organisations were invited to give oral evidence to the Women and Qualities Select Committee inquiry out of which the current Tory proposals for law change are, have been developed. So the consultation that the Tory government have announced um, is, a, is a direct descendant from the transgender inquiry produced by the Women and Equalities Select Committee. So women were carved out from that, but women's voices are being heard louder and louder as more and more women be begin to understand what is at stake. So one of the difficulties in having is this debate is that the very attempts to talk about the issues that Heather was raising, you know, sex as a material reality, distinct from gender, um, you know, and the that this material reality has huge social significance because of endemic male violence against women and girls, because of sexism, because of stereotypes, because of the imposition of ideas about gender. You know, all of this part of the debate is ruled offensive. Um, the very terrain of the debate is being ruled by some quarters as offensive or damaging or hurtful. So, and that's because it undermines that assertion, trans women are women, and usually hashtag no debate. And that's, but I think we are cutting through that and saying, no, you know, there has to be a discussion because these are life and death issues for women. Ireland is about to go to the polls over the right of women to have sovereignty over their own female reproductive systems, which are referenced in the, the Constitution as belonging to women. You know, this is about our embodied reality. And we can't have an understanding of women's oppression as, you know, if we can't have that understanding of women's oppression as rooted in sexist control of our biology, we can't really fight sexism at all. So we're not going to be shut up about our bodies and about the material reality of sex and about sexism. If women had had a chance to voice their concerns to the Women and, Equal women and Quality Select Committee and shape their recommendations, then they may have heard that single-sex services sex-based rights and protections are important to women and they perhaps would have had different recommendations. So our second reason for existing is that um, women-only spaces must be upheld 
and, where necessary, extended. So I want to talk a little bit about what those spaces are. Um, I disagree a little about um, the, the assertion that the Equality Act is going to be untouched, unchanged by changes to the Gender Recognition Act um, and that, therefore, we should be less alarmed. Um, we are, in fact, accused of creating moral panic um, because we raise this issue of the exemptions in the Equality Act. So I just want to say very briefly what they are and what's happening with them. So the Equality Act permits single women-only services um, which can discriminate on grounds of sex against males and also on grounds of gender reassignment. And it's lawful to exclude someone who is transgender, even if they've changed their legal sex to female and have a GRC, if that is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And the kinds of legitimate aims that people talk about, women talk about, when you ask them, well, you know, what do you think would be a legitimate aim where that would be proportionate? They talk about the kind of service that I used, a group, group therapy for female survivors of male sexual violence in childhood. They talk about um, domestic violence refuges. They talk about rape crisis centres. There, there's a whole plethora of services where that would be reasonable. Um, there are occupational requirements where you can make, where you can say that someone can't be male, can't be a transgender person, even if they're legally female. Those might be a independent sexual violence advisor, for example, or someone working in a refuge might be covered under those exemptions, genuine occupational requirements. Competitive sports, Dawn has spoken about. It's lawful to exclude people born male from women-only sporting competitions when physical strength, stamina, or physique are major factors <coughs> in determining success or failure, and so on. So there are six areas, including women-only clubs and associations. If we wanted to have this meeting be a women-only meeting, I mean, we're very glad that we've got brothers in the room, but if we wanted to have this meeting be a women-only meeting, that is lawful. All women shortlists in the Labour Party. <laughs> it's subject to some discussion, but Section 104, Clause 7 of the Equality Act says that it is lawful for political parties to restrict the selection of election candidates to those who share the protected characteristics of the female sex. But notably, it is not lawful to have an exclusive shortlist for any other protected characteristic. And the, uh, the logic of that is obvious. We don't have parity in Parliament for women, and we are an underrepresented majority. And that makes us different from all the other protected characteristics, which are underrepresented in many cases, but are not 51% of the population. So actually, the clause before the clause I just read out, um, clause 6, makes it clear that you can't have an exclusive shortlist for a, another protected characteristic. So the Labour Party has claimed that there's some loophole of why they can why they don't have to observe this and why they can have self-identifying women and why the Labour Party is in a better position than a gender recognition panel to decide who is legitimately a trans woman or not. Um, but that remains to be tested, I think, in law, and I think that will go to law. And the sixth um, item is communal accommodation. So it's lawful to discriminate on grounds of both sex and gender reassignment for, to, in order to provide single-sex communal accommodation for sleeping arrangements and sanitary facilities. So those are the areas of exemptions where women-only spaces, women-only services, women-only you know, women employment are legal within the Equality Act. And we think these need to be upheld but also extended. Why do I say they need to be extended? Because it's a permissive 
legislation, but there's no obligation to provide any of those services at all. And that means that women fee many women think they have these rights, but actually it's only a right of a service provider or an employer or an institution. So if the International Olympic Committee decides it doesn't want to discri discriminate on grounds of sex and provide separate female and male sporting events, the International Olympic Committee can do something different. You know, that's, it's only a permissive exemption. So, these exemptions are already being made unworkable. When we think about the debate and how toxic the debate is, think about what it means to be a service provider and to be able to state openly that you want to invoke these exemptions. Think about what it means to be a hospital, an NHS trust, and your interpretation of the elimination of mixed sex accommodation, which is a very popular policy, I think, elimination of mixed sex accommodation. You, your interpretation of that, you want to invoke Equality Act exemptions to ensure that when you say it's a female ward, it really is a female ward. Um, it, it has actually become very, very difficult for organisations to invoke those exemptions. And that has resulted in a postcode lottery for women. You, as a woman, wanting to use a single-sex service, like I, as a teenager, used a single-sex service, a group therapy for survivors of sexual violence, I may say it's an absolute barrier to me that someone that I perceive as physically male because they are physically male, it's an absolute barrier to me for, to use that service if that person is also being invited to use that service. So therefore, that's, that service is no longer accessible to me. And sadly, the particular service that I used has made that decision to be open to, on the basis of self-identity. And that is, that's what it's like for women in that area. Now, another area, the service might provide a different kind of arrangement or service. But it's a complete postcode lottery and completely top down. So, you know, this is something we could change. We could say that women have certain rights to demand the invocation of single sex exemptions, which are legal. We could say um, that the bureaucratic pressures on organisations to show that something is a proportionate means to achieve a legitimate aim we could put a counter-balancing bureaucracy on the other side and say, you know, if you want to remove, if you don't want to invoke exemptions, you have to show what the equality impact is on women of not invoking those exemptions. So, I've gone a little bit off-piste. <laughs> so, so these exemptions, they allow that if, if invoked, they would permit NHS hospitals to insist on the elimination of mixed sex accommodation on the basis of sex rather than gender. They would permit prisons to be sex segregated. If invoked, they would allow girl guiding to insist that brown owls and guide leaders are actually female. If invoked, they would allow a swimming pool to insist that women-only swimming sessions are sex segregated rather than gender segregated. If invoked, they would allow sex segregation of accommodation on school trips. If invoked, they would allow an employer to insist um, that those employed as a mammographer is actually female. Um, but they have to be invoked. And they're not being invoked. So when you book a shared cabin on the Caledonian Sleeper Service, I'm in Newcastle, so I don't think there are very many people who are going to use a sleeper service up to Scotland here. But, <laughs> but coming from further afield, using the Caledonian sleeper service, you, you can no longer guarantee that a stranger sharing your cabin will be of the same sex. They might be of the same declared gender identity as you. That is a different thing. Um, and the same is true of the Youth Hostel Association. Um, if you book a shared dorm, you can't expect the dorm to be single sex uh, it, rather than single gender. If you request a same-sex healthcare practitioner for a cervical smear, you might be provided with someone physically male who identifies as a woman. And these are things that are already happening, already before we have any change to the Gender Recognition Act. So this is about the relationship between culture 
and law. So we need a very thoroughgoing review of how exemptions are being applied now because there are already huge areas in which women are being let down. And that's our third demand. We need a review of all of these applications of exemptions. And the fourth demand is that the government consult with women's organisations and I would say actually find ways to consult directly with women about how self-declaration self would impact women. Because you know, one of the biggest impacts is the cultural change that follows law change. Um, self-declaration or self-identification in law would provide the state's backing to a philosophical claim which, determine, which says that what determines a person's sex is what they state about themselves. That is the move that is made when you say that there is no gatekeeping, there is no, um, there's no threshold, it's simply an administrative exercise to change sex. And it's not true to say that that's the situation we're in now. Yeah, so we, we, already have, we already are moving into that culture, but it would be greatly accelerated by the legal backing that says self-identification is legally, is legally as well as culturally a valid idea. Um, we are already in a situation where it is rude to ask questions, you know, even in your own head about a person's sex. If you're in a changing room and someone who you perceive to be male because they are physically male comes in, there's a moment where you might think, can I go to the person at the ticket desk in the swimming pool, whatever, and say, do you know what, there's a man in the women's changing room. I think we're still at the point where we can go and say that, but I think that will change if the law says that it's completely plausible that that person could have changed their legal sex. Okay, so the last reason, uh, the last reason we exist, our last demand is that self-identification has very serious implications for how we understand sexism and the treatment of women on the basis of sex, particularly in the field of data gathering. And that's why we so strongly opposed the suggestion of the Office of National Statistics when they said they wanted to make sex a non-mandatory question. Um, and that's not just because it would have made the census data less reliable, but because it would have set the standard for all other data gathering, including equalities monitoring. So we're very glad that the ONS have rode back on that proposal. I think that's an you know, excellent um, indication that campaigning can be effective and work. Um, and that they will, and they've committed to keeping the question about sex mandatory. But there's lots of other areas where people are collecting data and it's getting a little bit muddy. If we no longer know what is meant by the data around sex, bluntly, if we no longer know whether the categories male or female are referring to differences of physical sex or to different gender identities, we can no longer really say that much which is valuable about the experience of people with female bodies. Um, there are an estimated 120 million missing women in the world today. The women who would be here were it not for sex-selective abortion, female infanticide, and unequal treatment of girls. And these women are missing because of sexism, because they were recognised on an ultrasound or when they were born as having a vulva. They were nev they've never grown old enough to have complex internal feelings about how they relate to their bodies or to the gender norms of their societies. So, you know, this is about sex, it's about female and male bodies and how these bodies are treated socially. What can we say about health data if we start collecting sex on the basis of feelings rather than physical bodies? How can we analyse sex disparities in employment sectors? For example, train driving, if we can no longer unpick whether an increase in women train drivers is a result of girls bravely challenging sexist stereotypes that they've been 
had imposed on them from birth about um, the suitability of train driving for girls, or whether an increase might be because the number of physically male people identifying as women has increased. And where you have very large disparities between male and female in a group, for example, train drivers, you don't need very much transition to start showing up in this very small group of female train drivers. And there are other groups that, where that is similar, and I would say that prisons, where male prisoners outnumber female prisoners by 20 to 1 or more, when, when you have an opportunity for male prisoners to be housed in the women's estate through self-identification, it doesn't take very, a very large proportion of your male prison population to do so, to have a huge impact on the much smaller women's estate. So, these different things, transition from one gender identity to another, and the reality of having a sexed body in a sexist society, these, the differences between those two different things, they're not trivial. It goes to the heart of sexism, that women are subject to expectations and restrictions on the basis of our sex, and we have an embodied political and social experience that requires acknowledgement. So that is what Women's Place UK stands for. That is why we do these meetings. That is why we lobby politicians. That is why we provide resources so that ordinary women and men who support us can lobby politicians. Meet your MPs. Write to them, yes, you'll get a fob off letter. Meet your MPs, talk to them. Put these facts, put these issues, put these concerns in front of them and speak to them because we are shifting things. We are shifting things. Thank you. Thank you.